my career is split one half uh, industry, aerospace industry, and the second half university. Uh, and uh, so that gives me a particularly uh, perspective on uh, the subject which others may not have. Uh, I'm also, and I think this is relevant to the purposes that you have, uh, I'm editor-in-chief of a journal, international journal, Technological Forecasting and Social Change. Uh, I was asked to start this by Elsevier, who is the world's largest journal publisher, uh, headquartered in Amsterdam. I was asked to start this in 1968. The first issue as a quarterly came out in 1969, and it's been going ever since. So it's over uh, 36 years now. And uh, uh, we now have nine issues a year, and all the uh, issue, they, the issues go to subscribers in over 40 countries, mainly institutions, but it's also available. All the articles are available on the internet, www.sciencedirect.com. So uh, that gives me some perspective on, on the uh, uh, f forecasting community, and I'm in touch with a lot of people in that community. Well, you're obviously very experienced, in, experienced with you know, forecasting the future, forecasting technology. What do you think the future has in store, sort of generally? Well, we're obviously going, we're in the uh, information technology era. Now, each era, so if you go back, and we sometimes look at it in terms of long waves or Kondratiev waves, which are econom originally done, the name comes from the Russian economist Kond Kondratiev, uh, these are 50 to 60 year cycles of boom and bust, you know, prosperity and depression that have been pretty regular uh, with that kind of interval, 50 to 60 years. And um, uh, each era is associated with kind of a primary or overarching technology. And you've had uh, uh, steel and railroads and uh, oil, and now you're in the information technology era, uh, which uh, will be uh, going until, certainly will be primary un until at least uh, maybe 2025 or so. But then we're looking at also what's coming after that. And what it looks like clearly today is that'll be what uh, I call a molecular technology era which is uh, nanotechnology, biotechnology. Uh, so these are kind of the main trends that we see. Um, and you have, a, of course, convergence as, as well. You, it's becoming, the old boundaries are disappearing, boundaries between the sciences, like biology, chemistry, and physics. Biology is, for example, becoming partly a computer science. And on the other hand, computers uh, are taking on some of the characteristics of biological systems. The virus is already something we're all aware of. So you have these uh, 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 a kind of a fuzzying up of boundaries as well. But these are the main main trends uh, that uh, you know we can conceive. Another th uh, aspect that I'm concerned about, in view of my editing of the journal and it's an international journal, as I said before, is that we used to have, when we started off, 50% of our contributors and subscribers were American. Now that's changed since the 1990s. It's now down to more like 30% American and 33% uh, or so European and 33% Asian. And that's reflected, I mean, in our articles. And since we're dealing with a forecasting community, it's kind of an omen, you know, about what's happening uh, as, uh, as we just heard in the talk. Your studies also show that innovations may be shifting in the future from the U.S. So uh, as I was mentioning, this is uh, kind of corroborated in a way in our uh, journal. Now, as a global citizen, it doesn't matter much, I mean, whether it's done one place or the other. 
It's only uh, a concern as an American because uh, it might ultimately, if we get um, more and more of the impact of the uh, fundamentalists in the government, uh, kind of theocratic-oriented uh, uh, government, it may lead to a brain drain, a kind of reverse brain drain. Instead of people coming here to do science, they may be going to Europe or Asia to, to do the work because it's a more hospital, hospitable uh, climate there for, for research and development in areas like, for example, biotechnology, where we get a lot of ethical questions. And uh, we already see the stem cell uh, debate, and this may impact other areas as well you know, that are related to uh, biotechnology and f the future possibilities that you have. So those are some of the concerns. How, how worried do we need to be as Americans that sort of the, the force behind it isn't, isn't as America as much as it once was? Well, I'm, I mean, as an American, I, I uh, of course, biased to like to see, like to see uh, the uh, uh, research and development that the leadership was provided in science and technology by the United States. Uh, in the 20th century to continue, uh, and I, I hope it will, but I've got some gnawing concerns about it. But as I said before, as a global citizen, I mean, you know, the work will go on. The only question is how much of it will be done here. We already have, as you, if you read the book by uh, uh, Tom Friedman, The World is Flat, he writes about uh, Microsoft having, uh, uh, doing some recruiting for a lab they wanted to start in Beijing, China, and uh, interviewing you know, 2,000 applications, interviewing the people and uh, picking 20 of the best people. And that laboratory now is, uh, uh, is going and it's the most uh, the strongest uh, laboratory of any of Microsoft's facilities. So, you know, you have already clues that work is really blooming in other areas. India is another area where uh, Tom Friedman gives a lot of examples of entrepreneurs, and India has some of the uh, best uh, in Indian, uh, the Indian Institutes of Technology are about the same, the level, academically, level of MIT. So those uh, uh, graduates no longer have to go to the U.S. to be effective. I mean, they can stay at home and, and do their work, and we'll get more and more innovations there, too. You, s you said it's, it's looking more and more like the next era of technology is going to be molecular technology. What, what all does that entail? Well, I mean, nanotechnology means uh, uh, it's uh, one, uh, it, it's 10 to the minus uh, nine uh, meters, the scale. It's a small scale, 10 to the minus seventh to 10 to the minus 10th uh, meters, which means you're working at the molecular level. And the question uh, is, uh, you have all types, the enthusiasts talk about all types of possibilities of manufacturing things at that level. You already have miniaturization all over the place. Uh, you have uh, MEMS, Microelectromechanical Systems, M-E-M-S, which uh, are being uh, produced by Sandia Corporation, for example, in Albuquerque, which are very small machines, basically. I've seen one that's a, uh, about, I would say, a quarter of an inch by uh, a half an inch dimensions and very thin, which has, uh, you can only see what's going on if you have it projected on a screen. And you see that there are gears and wheels going. It's a mechanical system. So uh, you can implant these and use them in all kinds of devices, as we're already using some of these in uh, uh, automotive uh, airbag and so on. So there's a lot more that can be done in that area. And the question is, how much can you be uh, uh, building 
uh, on that scale, l only small scale or larger devices. I'm not an expert on it, but uh, you know there are all kinds of possibilities being discussed. Uh, also, of course, uh, tailor-made ma tailor materials, custom-made to specifications, certain a certain uh, density or certain strength that you can make according to what you need, uh, create artificial materials. So in that sense, uh, they, you can be providing the, resource na the resources that you now rely on as in the natural environment, you can be creating those uh, artificially. So that's nanotechnology and you can make um, uh, already medical uh, medications that uh, uh, are designed, custom designed to individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, your own DNA to respond to your uh, particular needs rather than one to serve a, a huge number of people. You can custom make them. So those are all kinds of things that are in the works. And, uh, and uh, biotechnology, we, we, uh, it's a, in a sense, unlimited horizon. What we, would, uh, we, we can hardly imagine yet what we can do with it. I mean, there are these popular things that are being discussed as like uh, stem cells research and, and cloning and so on, but a lot, a lot of other things. So that's, uh, you know, there's a great possibility. Uh, how much, and some of this, for example, I mentioned in, in, uh, involves chemistry as well as biology. In fact, the distinction, as I mentioned before, the boundaries are getting fuzzy between chemistry and biology and physics. Uh, and um, uh, you may be making uh, new materials of all kinds. You said that there are just unlimited possibilities for what this, this next era of technology is going to bring. What do we need to be cautious of? Well, all, uh, particularly in biotechnology, uh, there, are, there are serious ethical questions involved. I mean, we talk about longevity of a life uh, uh, span increase. Uh, we are talking about, uh, I mean, th those, you see, any new technology is not a 100% uh, gain. There's always a positive side and a negative side. Uh, you know, just like automobiles, uh, they're great uh, value and convenience, but they can also kill, and they can also cause a tremendous pollution. So you have, almost in any technology that you create, they are possible of use and misuse. Nuclear technology can be an important energy source, but obviously is also a destructive force. So uh, biotechnology will also create new ethical questions that are very serious about the uh, 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 maintaining life, you know, we're already running into this question of, uh, uh, for example, the discussion about uh, uh, death with dignity, the act that was passed in Oregon twice and has been fought uh, by the Bush administration to trying to overturn it. Well, that's, uh, you know, the, uh, and you see Congress being, getting involved, rightly or wrongly, in ethical questions, like the Chiavo case, uh, which was, you know, in, in, insane in my view to get involved with that. It's a private matter, you know, but uh, there are forces that are trying to, uh, are concerned about the uh, religious aspects of it. And uh, so a lot of ethical aspects, and those will get more and more uh, uh, front burner because of the, uh, because biology is, uh, you know, obviously deals with human beings and therefore the effects. Some th in some things, uh, I think clean energy, I think, is a possibility. Well, I'm, you know, I'm not uh, that much concerned about it. And, ma and uh, material resources, I'm also not sh running short of, I'm not so concerned about, we can find substitutes for almost everything except maybe water. Water, I think, is in the long run a much more serious global problem than, than uh, energy. What aspects of the future haven't we talked about that you think are important? 
Well, I mean, there are all kinds of uh, social aspects, education, uh, work. For example, uh, if we go t more and more to a, uh, a, a outsourcing, which Friedman also talks about, where you're initially you're outsourcing as you are today to China, manufacturing. Uh, my son is a uh, vice president of a uh, large uh, 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 chain of stores, uh, retail stores, but they also do manufacturing in California. And because of the difficulty of a high cost to manufacturing in California with wages and workman's compensation and so on, like many other companies, they've shifted their manufacturing to China. All right, so that takes manufacturing jobs away. Uh, if we take, if we uh, find substitutes for, for, for example, for wood, we were running, you know, out of forest, so we, I mean, we were cutting down forest left and right, but that, in, of course, means you're, you're losing, like in Oregon, where I've lived for many years, uh, you're using uh, uh, lumber, you know, losing lumber jobs. Uh, lumber mills are closing, have closed down. And so you, you, you've lost that. Now, we're already at the next stage where service jobs are being outsourced. India, if you call to make reservations uh, uh, or talk, want help for AOL, you call the help desk, you get somebody in India. And, uh, or you want to make hotel reservations and so on. So we're outsourcing those jobs. So, you know, so there's some real concerns about where are we heading with uh, uh, retraining. I mean, the difficulty, for example, of people becoming obsolete. Even engin an engineer out of school for 10 years is already, in a sense, becoming obsolete because the, the work, uh, the, you know, the knowledge changes. So either he, you get to lifelong learning or <laughs> Or else, sometimes often they go into administrative work, but uh, you know that's a serious problem when people become uh, obsolete, and uh, not everybody is uh, by nature inclined to do lifelong learning. Some people take to it very easily, and uh, but others don't. And you can't, you know, and we can't expect everybody to do uh, do a service job, like say. Um, handing out hamburgers at McDonald's, uh, although we, the service industry, like some jobs, clearly are require people like care of, of uh, sick people, you've nursing and so on. These are going to remain jobs that you can't uh, outsource. Uh, but uh, that's, you know, that still leaves a lot of question about where future jobs are coming from. So far, uh, the uh, fact that we don't have answers to all these questions, uh, the, uh, the optimists have generally been more right than the pessimists. That's one thing that uh, uh, is uh, kind of basically to keep in mind because the, uh, uh, the optimists uh, recognize there may be solutions even if we can't see them today, there'll be new solutions. But, you know, I sometimes, when I give a talk, I sometimes uh, uh, mention this, uh, this story about the forecaster that was asked by a reporter, a very famous forecaster, was asked the obvious question, sir, how do you feel about the future? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? So the wise man thought for us, says, well, basically I'm optimistic. So the reporter said, sir, if you're optimistic, why do you look so worried? And the wise man thought a little more, stroked his beard and said, well, I really don't think my optimism is justified. So that, <laughs> that reflects about how I feel about the future. Great. Thank you. Okay.